I'm just saying the community is advocating for you to be stroking me. So, uh, well, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am at San Hollow, Utah uh, for TakeOver 2022. Uh, the previous uh, episode was with um, uh, Dave from Craftworks uh, Off-Road uh, talking about superchargers. And now we're going to be talking uh, about Speed UTV. And today I have a special guest, uh, somebody I've been trying to get around to talking and meeting uh, for a long time. Uh, Todd Romano, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. And, yeah, I'm super uh, great stoked to be to here see in you. Southern Utah. It's a blast. Yeah, you, this is actually stomping grounds for you, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I'm very fortunate. I live up there just outside of Salt Lake and Park City. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sixes. You know, Moab and here are two different types of uh, riding areas. But I kind of prefer it here. I was just in Moab a couple weekends ago because we only get a small window to ride the whole enchilada, which is this pretty epic 35 mile mountain bike trail that starts way at the top of uh, like the LaSalle's at almost 13,000 feet and uh, descends down to the Colorado River. So the timing of riding there is really tricky. Uh, so we go there really to ride that, but predominantly we come here just because it has everything. You know, I was out, I, just, I literally just hopped off the dirt bike. So His dirt awesome. bike is right there, right <laughs> outside the window. So I come here to ride the. the you know, Rampage is Friday, so I got, you know, Cam Zink and uh, Tyler McCall, or, and Cam McCall, is, as, who's uh, one of the hosts, is all good buddies of mine, so we're going to go there Friday and, and then just get out here and ride all this pretty aggressive technical riding. I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm used to, I mean, all the years of desert racing, you know, doing 10 miles an hour for your average. I think I averaged 13 <laughs> miles an hour today. It's mountain bike speed, but it's, it's some pretty tricky stuff and really big exposures up there. You know, there's, like, there's yeah. some stuff you're two, 3,000 feet above the valley floor. And, right. Uh, Stunning views, a little bit uh, nerve wracking at some times, but it's it's we come here for that kind of riding, so it's really really I, awesome. I tell people over and over again that uh, this specific area will change your mind on how you think about off roading, yes. just because your perspective is so stretched out. Like you you get in so into your niche. Everybody, I mean, the average consumer doesn't go at fifty miles outside of where they live, right? Yep. And and so when you come here, you're just like your perspective on what's possible. And what's possible in one day? In one day. And you nail it. So interesting enough, we we were up by, uh, there's a new golf course at the bottom of the ridge with a private airport. I don't know yep. what that area is called yep. over there, but that's where we kind of unloaded. And there, there was guys shooting. There was guys out on their UTV. There was families on their quads. There was guys like me motoing. Uh, people playing golf. And then, you know, people out here boating today. And, I mean, you could, everything's within 10 minutes, you know. Yeah. And last year we did Tokerville Falls. I had never done that before. I, I really wanted to get out this season and do it, but and that is uh, that's quite the adventure. We're going to do that again. Uh, just and the only way to get there really is to follow the river and, and take it. that canyon. We did all. I did was drive the river last year. Yeah, and I don't know how much water is in it this year, but last year I had my Ultra Four here that uh, a real dear friend of mine has passed away, built for me, and uh, uh, props to, to Gerald King Smitty for uh, what he did. It's a spectacular car. It made that pretty easy and you know robbie and our engineers they're all driving our speed utvs in there and yeah they're not we're not rock crawl guys you know right. i think i rock crawl more than all of them so uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, all the slow speed stuff is uh unique but uh it was great even robbie loved it he's like this is spectacular because all the canyon and water and yeah it's just that's what i think uh you know and hopefully uh no offense to the people from california that keep moving here trying to change our <laughs> laws and rules but uh utah's a stop is retiring out, here please <laughs> it's an outdoor riding area and uh it's utah's known for access and privilege and uh and privilege to play and i think that's something unique that hurricane's done in st george and, and whatever they're a little bit more open to the idea of coexisting right mm -hmm. like we talk about moab and the, and the the issues they're having over there and, and it's becoming because somebody else wants it for themselves is really what it comes down to. And out here, it seems like there's a little bit more understanding of like, this is a good thing. This, is, this isn't a prop up our economy. This isn't a keep the tourism coming through. And if we just play the game right, we can keep a healthy uh, ecosystem out here. Well, I'll tell you, it's something interesting. You know, I, I, I moved to Arizona when I was 18 and went to college at Arizona State. And back then, that's when I started racing mountain bikes. I actually raced for Specialized. Um, but mountain biking just took off at that point. But so the trails prior to that were horse and moto. And right. predominantly, either ridden by like cattle and animals that kind of cut their own footpath for feeding and grazing, right? Yep. Then, yep. then horse expanded it, and then the moto guys really blew it up, and we made massive trail systems out there. And I go back there these years, and there's a place up by like Peniman Dynamite, which was some of the most famous single track you could ride. And now you have to start at 135th Street, and the reason is is that golf courses were made, right? Uh, equestrian centers were made, and and 
and uh, expansion, expansion, and, and even mountain biking. Hey, I, I I ride mountain bikes. I think more than probably anybody that would ever listen to this podcast. I ride, <laughs> I ride like seven days a week. I think, and uh, I, I ride every one of sports. I have had horses. I ride bikes. I ride moto. I mean, I I'm, I hike. You know, all that stuff. I backcountry ski, and lobbyists are what's happening. So the not picking on anybody, any different lobby group, but you know, a golf lobbyist was like, I don't want to hear dirt bikes. Right, and, and the equestrian group is like, I don't like head-ons with dirt bikes, or I don't want this in my backyard. And, and eventually, unfortunately, money is and lobbying is what changes laws. Right. So as much as this is where it is today, it just depends who doesn't like like Moab. They don't like the sound of the UTV going by their homes at night, and I, I respect that a little bit. You know, it's like I, there's no reason you can't just be on a trailer. Uh, right. I know it's much easier to to like we drove over here. We're standing at the golf course, you know, across the street. It's great to be able to drive here, but if you told me I had to tow. I'd still come here. Right. So if, if, if our access is compromising other people's way of life and all we have to do is trailer or, or do something a little deep. And unique, or just be considerate. And considerate. Then we still have access. Right. Right. I mean, I mean, I was going to Glamis when I was 18 years old and to see what's changed there and all the different things. And we used to have, I mean, the comp, is it comp or olds? Whatever. Yeah. Olds, the one by the, by the highway. Right. When I was growing up there was live bands like top LA bands would come there and play on a Saturday night. Wow. And we'd have, party it out. We'd have 50, 60,000 people at the bottom of the hill. And unfortunately, you know, things got rowdy. There was fights and, you know, all those things change it. So as much as our industry has grown, especially in the COVID year, uh, it'd be great to make sure we, we manage that. And I'm not a lobbyist. I'm, I'm actually just someone who goes out and plays more than probably most. So I, right. I, I hate to see us lose it. Utah's really good about making sure we have access. And I've talked with uh, like the UTV Utah guys and, and discussed Moab issues and discussed, you know, the growing pains of all this, right? And over the years, like you were saying, these trails, these areas, there's always the group before and the group coming up and there's going to be a group after. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, if we don't speak up, not only to our government, but to each other yep. to be responsible, to be con- considerate, to, to not... You know, go party all night and then rip your razor, drift it around the corner with your sound system rolling at 1 a.m. That like, was not me last night. <laughs> I was not. We have a really good sound system. I don't know. In the car. It was, it it was a blue car. It, it was a blue car. Me. So I, I have my have suspicions. You, have you heard it? That sound, that kicker sound system is so damn good. I, I'm probably one of those guys. I have my headset on and and I get the tune so damn loud so I can hear it through my headset. I'm probably blowing out that. I'm probably that. But uh, all those rednecks. I'm probably one of them. I think it's important that, you know, people that are influential in our industry stick up for our industry. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times we it's a hard, hard battle and it's a logistical battle. Yeah. We can't always know who to talk to, how to talk, how to we don't want to put the money into the legislative part of it. Like we don't we don't have tons of money to throw at legislative. Yeah. We're not the big corporates. Right. And uh, but it's important that we can have influence. Right. Like U2V Utah and their their group of people that go to the meetings that go to the. The, the council meetings and, and defend what we have are so critical to us keeping what we have. Yep. So um, you alluded to some of the history that you've had. Let's let's hear a little bit about that because I mean there are a lot of people that know you know your racing background and things like that. Uh, but a lot of our industry has grown so much in sure. the last couple of years. Uh, let's figure out who Todd is and, and where you come from. So uh, small town in uh, in uh, Rhode Island called Smithfield. I grew up there. Uh, actually. Left there at 18 and uh, went to Arizona State. I, I was really fortunate. Uh, played a lot of great high school sports and uh, I got in a car wreck my senior summer. I was supposed to go play uh, hockey for Umaine Orono and I got in a got in an accident and uh, broke my back and there was no more hockey. So Arizona State was rated the number one party school uh, by Playboy in 1988, <laughs> dating myself a little bit. And I could have went to URI, redshirted a year at Umaine Oreo, where it was Umaine Orono, which is so it's such a cold, cold state. Um, or go to Arizona State. Like right. I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to Arizona State, and uh, and just love living in the West. You know, growing up in the East, you had a lot of great stuff, and you know, between the waters and the ocean sports, we could get into. But West in the desert was great, and moved there, and the mountain bike boom ticked off when I went to college. So I raced with some of the greats back then, and uh, it was funny. There's this new mountain bike Facebook page that's like. A heritage page, oh. and it, it, it gets like all in. And if for everybody who probably doesn't follow mountain bikes, probably boring people. But like John Tomac, his son Eli Tomac oh, yeah, races Tomac. Supercross, right? So his dad 
was probably one of the most famous racers uh, of him, Ned Overin, Richard Graywall, Tinker Juarez, all those guys. That was our group of, of racers. We all kind of cut our teeth together and raced Mammoth downhill in purple and yellow day glow outfits, right? We thought we were cool <laughs> back then. And, uh, but it's been great because to see Johnny train his son Eli and Eli do so well in, in, in motocross. And what happened to me, Johnny uh, Tomac was beating everybody especially like at mammoth downhill and you know some of the great downhill races uh that we used to race and uh and, he's, and the question was posed to him by like an interview like this right and i was why are you going so fast he's like well, i started riding dirt bikes and uh you know the speed and actually robbie robbie gordon's my business partner and uh i sat with robbie like 20 years ago when robbie was i think still in indycar he hadn't gone to nascar yet and uh and I said to him, I go, hey, how, do you, how are you so fast in the desert? Like, what do, you, what do you do? What's so different? He goes, Todd, I spend all weekend at 240 miles an hour, 220, whatever, the, whatever they're doing it back then, 200 miles an hour. So coming to the desert and averaging 60. Now, let me tell you, averaging 60 in the desert is, is, <laughs> That's is, actually something. is something, especially when you realize <laughs> how slow some stuff was. I tell you how slow we're on motorbikes today. Yeah, yeah. Baja, since Roger Norman took it over, he slowed it down a lot. It's almost like you might do better in an Ultra 4. Like, I know, give it... Five years, in in I believe you'll see a UTV win Baja overall. I, I have a working theory that that is like with the players as a new marketing yep. and with the Pro R and everything. I firmly believe, and with all the money they've been putting into uh, to Baja and things like that, and I, I firmly believe they're trying to push the trucks out and become the new platform that well, that everybody looks to. Well, think about this. And I was on a, a great call with Best of the Desert. Uh, Best of the Desert sits down with every OE. We're a, we're all in this big. Uh, committee i mean everybody uh can-am polaris yamaha honda we're all there we all talk and we, we talk about rules and how do we grow and one of the biggest concerns was 15 years ago i mean robbie raced for ford right 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 um chevy was in you know everybody was in honda was uh honda motorcycles was down there every every factory was there there's no factories in, in off-road racing anymore the only factories are utvs so when you think i think it was phil burton did one vegas torino i forget who won vegas torino this year but the utv payout was greater than the trophy truck. The, the, the right. team that won Vegas Torino won twenty three thousand dollar purse. Yeah. In UTV. So now you, if you look at it, and we're talking about how as as OEs we can do homologation, do all this great stuff to, to really, be factories in off road racing again. And okay, it's not automotive, but it's power sports. Right. And power sports. I mean, if you look at Supercross and what they've done, and and now you look at uh. What's happening overseas with with hard enduro and what, right. how big that's become? It's huge over there. And I don't know. I'll tell you, Manny Lettenbetter. If you guys follow hard enduro, that guy is <laughs> unreal. I, I I went and did my version of hard enduro. <laughs> I call it I call it just enduro, and I made it hard. It was <laughs> it yeah. was brutal today. No, but. that that for anyone that wants to watch Superman perform a stunt, yes. that's what you watch. Yeah, because all of those guys are just insanely unworldly athletes. Yeah. So. So Tomac rode a bike. I'm buying a bike. I need to get faster. I can't keep losing to Johnny. And Johnny was a, just a talented rider. And so I bought a dirt bike and uh, started racing best in the desert and uh, got really good at racing. And uh, then went to Baja and, you know, did shit. Me and a buddy, we call it Iron Man. We Iron Man the thousand once in our own way. We, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've Iron Man the, I've Iron Man the, uh, uh, the 500 and the 250. I've never Iron Man truly the thousand. But what we did one year is we said, we bought. We had three XR 650s, two we cha we pre ran on, and one we raced on, all identical bikes. And on race day, my buddy ran the first six hours, so he ran from the start to Bay of LA. And then I well, there's a there's a there's a corner before you head down to Bay of LA, but let's call it Bay of LA. And then I took it from Bay of LA to Loretto. Oh wow! And then he took it from uh, Loretto. To La Paz, and yeah, so three. So there, maybe we had one more stint in there. But when when one guy got out, the other guy had to hop in the chase truck. Right. So we had no. It's not like he were downtime. No. So I, could, <laughs> I I rode six hours on the bike. I wonder what other stint I had. Whatever, because we each had two stints. We each rode twelve hours. It was like we finished in like twenty two hours. We took sixth overall. Oh wow. Uh, overall, four vehicles, two vehicles. It was a crazy year for us on bikes, and uh, but we it was crazy. Just got off the motorcycle, kept just took the boots off. And hopped in the chase <laughs> truck, which is, was his beater old Chevy at the time, and, and I grew it. And we were riding racing bikes, and then I started uh, Dragonfire racing. And Dragonfire, uh, you know, just kind of expanded when the Rhino came out. You know, I was, a, I was uh, racing with Yamaha at that time, and Bob Starr from Yamaha uh, approached me and said, Hey, I got this thing called a Rhino. 
It wasn't that <laughs> candid about it. But right. That's how I looked at it. I'm like, what do you want me to do with, with this agricultural product? <laughs> right. right. And he's like, you know, would you take it to the races with you? And, or would you make it cool? And I'm like, yeah, all right, I guess. And I put a cage on. I put two seats on. I put some beadlock wheels. And we took the Sandsport Super Show, whatever year that was, 20 years ago. I think that's about when the Rhino came out, right? And, uh, and everybody wanted our parts. You know, there was nobody else. There was a sand buggy show back then, right? Right. So all of a sudden, we're the only guy with a UTV there. And we kind of invented accessories for the Rhino at that time. And, and then all the Yamaha dealers took off. And then the Rhino craze went nuts. It went truly nuts. Truly. I mean, it, I, it is what started it all, basically. And you know what's crazy? If you think about iconic names. So uh, when you want to make a copy with a copier, right? People say, can you make me a Xerox? Right. right. It's, a, it's right. an iconic name, right? Xerox created it, right? Right. Kodak Film, right? All these, all these words that are, there's other brands now. There's other films. There's other copier companies. There's all this other stuff. But they all started it. Right. right. Google but, it. Google it. You nailed it, right? Yep. Kleenex. Yep. Right. So, but unfortunately for Rhino, it's now Polaris. Right. It's all a razor. It's, everything's a razor. Everything's a razor. It's funny. I get, we have our, Which, our, I mean, props to them. But imagine that what it took to do that. The only other company I know that's done that, in and it's in a different way, was Kodak invented imaging, right? And they were around for 100 years and went bankrupt. And Instagram, six guys in the garage, sold it for like $20 billion, right? It's crazy what they did. And they are imaging now. Right. And if you think it's about... It's redefined even like the hardware, like the cameras and everything, everything. else. So it's, so it's really interesting when you think what's happened with, with what Polaris did. And I'll give Craig Scanlon from Polaris. He became a good friend back in the day. I, I raced for Polaris for a while. I raced for every damn UTV factory. <laughs> <laughs> Money and cars. Like, that's what you did back then. So Polaris, Cowie. I mean, actually, I won a bunch for Cowie uh, in, in both dirt bikes and in, uh, in the UTV. Me and Reed Nordeen. Reed Nordeen used to be the head and, uh, of Team Green. And we all raced with me, Larry Rossler, Reed Nordeen. And like a prototype UTV we built back then when there wasn't a lot of rules. <laughs> I built a UTV very similar to the one we're selling today. And it did 115 10 years ago. Wow. And it really was an all I mean, the motor drive. wasn't really even capable. You really had to push the limits for that. It was a, it was a normally aspirated snowmobile motor. I can't get over how it went so fast. But our car weighed nothing. And it was on 33s. And it was 1,300 pounds. I mean, it was so stinking fast. That year, I could if I could go look it back up, we... We beat every single class on time except trophy truck in class one. And I took third in trophy and uh, sixth in trophy and third in class one on time. Wow. That's how fast that car was. And then uh, we're getting full circle on that whole concept nowadays, too. Yes. So, and that year we went, we won the 250, the 500, the 1000, the 250, and the 500 all in a row. That's crazy. Uh, all in that car. It was, a, it was really neat. I mean, it was a cheater car. There was, <laughs> there was no rules to say we were cheating, but as far as I was, you, we built we built something that no one else you had. We built a monster that to compete against people that didn't yeah. really have anything. And I think that's what we've done today. And uh, you know, I think we've we've really just sat back and said, what have we learned over the years? Uh, you know, when you look at most manufacturers, took quads and turned them into UTVs, and now that's changed. But initially, right, right, right. they were they were they were two up, and then they went side by side. Right, that's how the name. Well, came. I mean, we t we look back at the industry like it it all kind of started with snowmobiles. Yep. And then that turned into quads. And then that, that progression was, this would work if you put wheels on it, right? It was the same setup. Yeah. And you were still straddling it. It was, it was literally the same platforms. And now they were like, hey, we can, we can expound upon that. Yeah. And now we have UTVs. And, yeah. and the future is even more mind-blowing when you look at some of the stuff people are working on. But it's like we're, our industry has gone through this huge evolution that we are now far enough away from that a lot of people don't recognize it anymore. And I think yeah. it's super important to have conversations like this. Like, let's remember back when, what happened? Like, where did we come from? And, and how did we get to this point? Well, I remember when Craig Scanlon and Robbie was, Robbie and I were both racing for Polaris at that time. Um, Craig gave me a Razor, not an S. And so at Dragonfire, we turned a whole long travel kit and did all that stuff back in the day. And, uh, and Robbie, so at that time, I helped develop the Razor S and Robbie did the four. And... It was just like, this isn't enough. So we, we were like, hey, we need more to have fun. And we just, Robbie just built a four-seater and took it to Sand Sports. And I was making money selling long travel kits. But then 
the OEs came in and they said, okay, that, that was, those look awesome. Let's go build four seaters and let's go build, you know, wide travel. The, the Razor S came out, right? And, uh, and you see that evolution. And when I, then when I went over and raced for Team Green and, and Reed Nordine over there from Kawasaki, we built the whole um, uh, performance catalog. So like Yamaha has, has is it GTYR or GYTR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they have, and we, and Kawi, we did a whole performance catalog for Kau, Kaui. And you could buy long travel suspension and s- racing seats and everything. And, and actually, the T-Rex was probably one of the most reliable platforms. It wasn't the fastest Well, that would be the first thing any owner will tell you, yeah. yeah. Spectacular. And if you look at the new t- T-Rex 4-seater, right? It's the a T-Rex KRX 4. Again? KRX 4, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Phenomenal car. And then they, they, and they have a niche. And I'll tell you, for out here, for rock crawling and everything. Can you, like, you're seeing KRX, like, 3 to 1 out here. It's the right car. I mean, um, this this isn't like even though the sand dunes here, it's it's more trail riding and yeah. you know in we you know even if you have all the horsepower in the world, the trail has its own limitations, right? Um, and four four seat wheelbase for some of the steep walls we have to climb out here. Yeah, there's some steep stuff that I <laughs> I know I would not go up it. And I, I've I've fallen over more than I've stood up in my life, right? And I, I don't think there's some I won't go up in a two seater. Right. I will only go up for in sure. a four seater. For sure. Um, so, so that progression out of uh, working with the OEs and Dragonfire, I sold Dragonfire and got very fortunate and then uh, focused on my racing career and uh, progressed uh, my sponsors. And, you know, I got to thank all of them over the years because I was racing with Raceline and, and BF Goodrich helped me uh, get going. And uh, Tatum Motorsports, they, they sponsored me a car. Harley Lettner, who's a really famous buggy driver. We all raced together back in the day. Um, cut my teeth in class one and had a great success in class one. Um, I think I might have been in class one for like six years. And then, uh, you know, it's interesting. And I, it's funny. I just, I just learned that you can, you can do this thing where you can have these subscriptions on uh, Instagram. Have you heard about this? Where you can, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just, my, my wife's yep. like, you gotta, you gotta do this subscription thing and, and maybe share more stuff that you know, because I was going to do be an adjunct professor down at the U of U. Oh, really? And just come in and share <laughs> marketing and business strategies and all the stuff we learn. And if you look at racing over the years and, and the, in, in, off-road racing, not and not bikes. Bikes is, right. a, is a whole other story. But off-road four-wheel racing, once Toyota pulled out and Ford pulled out, there really hasn't been great money in, in off-road racing. And they look at all these teams, and and I'll give props to the uh, excuse me to the McMillans and the Menzies and the people who have generational passion. I call it. Yeah. They don't really care what what it. It's not a profit center. It's it's a family experience, and and that's what they do. And they go to win, and, and they're very passionate about it. But if you look at the guys who made a career and made money racing, it's very few. Right. Um, right. I'll give props to Rob Mack. Uh, Rob's a great friend, and yep. You know, and, and probably one of the, probably is the most winning all time guy. I'd have to look at that. If he's not, he's like right there. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, Rob said, "I'm going to go raise a half a million dollars and spend three hundred thousand. Right. And he's going to figure, I'm making up numbers, Rob. Sorry, I don't know what those numbers are. <laughs> um, but, you know, he had to make it. Rob didn't have another business, right? He didn't do it. So when I sold my company, Dragonfire, I'm like, well, how am I going to do this? And what I think, and this is why my wife said, you got to do these, these, pod, these uh, Instagram where you can do coaching. And she said, I got sponsorship because I was able to give calculated ROI to people. So when I, when I approached Hasbro, uh, and I raced for Hasbro Tonka for three years. I raced the Tonka trophy truck. I approached Tonka and I said, you guys are doing it all wrong. Which, by the way, like when you insult somebody who's doing a great <laughs> I just, job. I was just about to say, yeah. don't, don't start the conversation yeah. with the insult. Oh, well, it's funny. I think, <laughs> I think that's how I've made my career. I've made a career telling everyone that they're doing it wrong. I mean, and i got a business partner who loves telling everybody that they, that they, that they do everything wrong. But Rob, he said it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. now have permission, but he said it. He started it. So. I started it. I, I kicked the can down the road. You just put it in the goal. Yeah. <laughs> but... um. I said to them, I said, listen, you've made a career out of building inspirational toys. Right. Um, I said, but think about the buyer. The buyer is like five. The buyer isn't five to seven. The consumer is. But the buyer is mom, dad, grandpa, all these things, right? Yeah. So why not have an aspirational toy? I said, because that would allow grandpa to go, I'm getting, I'm getting Billy that Tonka trophy truck. That looks cool. And, hey, you know, dump trucks are great and, and D9 butt dozers are great, but that could be cool. And then if you get enough marketing behind it and it's everywhere and we were in, I mean, I was in Transformers 2 or 3, whatever, well, that one. Actually, it was, we were filmed in Moab. It was pretty cool. Right. They, the Transformers ran by the truck and we were, I think it was a quarter million dollar placement fee to put a truck in a parking lot and have, <laughs> have that hot chick, whatever her name is. That's I, Megan. 
Megan Fox. Yeah, Megan me crazy, I call her. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, yeah, she hid behind the car. Like, that was it for a quarter million dollars that Hasbro paid to put it in there. Um, But that that idea of saying, if you do this, I have access to to grow your shelf space. Because you can't just have a good idea. So what I was able to do over the years is I sat there and said, well, I can get you so many linear feet at Walmart, right? And that's where that's where Tonka Toys are sold. Walmart, right, right. KB Toys, right? It's it's all about shelf space. This is worth so many dollars, and if it isn't producing, you don't get the space, right? So I have some relationships. So even back then, you were recognizing that the the trend of just sticker placement was was no longer even a viable no. like direction. There's no money in it. I mean, right. I give Bryce Menzies, who's running the best program out there, the the McMillan, Duke, and, uh, Luke, and Dan running the best program out there. It doesn't matter what Foral Parts and Red Bull and, and BFG pay those guys or Toyo pay those guys. It's nowhere near what they're spending. Right. Right. So I was like, I'm going to make money doing it, and I'm going to go figure out how to convince Hasbro. So I did that, and we sold 5 million toys in the Wendy's Kids Meal in one month. <laughs> and I, So I, I'm into the royalty business. Right? Oh, that, for sure. Yeah. So was, we did like a quarter million toys a year. And I wow. don't care if you're getting pennies or dollars. A quarter million still adds up. A quarter up. million of anything. It adds up. And uh, so that is kind of how we did it. And then I did. Uh, I got hired by a company, Hawk Brakes, because they wanted uh, to grow their business. Uh, and they were a sponsor of mine. Carlisle Corporation sponsored me for almost a decade. But they wanted into AutoZone. I knew how to get people into AutoZone. And then if they wanted to get into FedEx, I mean, I got Hawk on every um, Mercedes Sprinter. At Federal Express, every brake pad and every rotor on every Sprinter in, in North America. Wow. So it's easy for them to write me, and I'm not bragging here, but like you can write you a check. They write me a million dollar check to go racing because I generated a hundred million. Right. And I know if you, so if, if you ever approach people and say, hey, if I give you a hundred million dollars and on that hundred million you make 40 million, it's 40% margin, or 30, right. I don't care if you made 30 million, what would you give me? Right. Right? That's, that's the question. And some people say, I'm not going to give you anything. All right, then I ain't going to get you the $100 million. Right. Some people say, I'll give you a million dollars. Some people say, give you, I'll give you $8 million. So everyone looks at So if the business model always is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to generate revenue. That's going to generate profit. And of that profit, how much are you going to share? That's how I went after sponsorship. So with VP Fuels and all the brands that have sponsored me over the years, my, my contract wasn't like Robbie's. Robbie had a... A, Again, a, Robbie, he's saying these things. Yeah, not it's all, me. It's all me, right? <laughs> but Robbie's contracts were performance related. Right. Right. He had to show up. He had a he had a victory schedule, most likely. I don't know on some of them. And then he had a finish schedule. So if you look at like a to- Toyo contract, they want you to show up to these five races. That co- that's that's so much money. They want you to to finish those races. That's yep. so much money. Then you get so much for your victory. Right. Um, you know, my kids were professional ski races and yeah, they were sponsored by Rosignol and all these great brands, but it was all about victory schedule. There was no money unless they were on the box. And if they're on the box, there was good money. Um, right. And, and I think people coming up in like racing or, or, or in any sport that requires sponsorship, like we forget as a racing community sometimes that we have to also return the value. And yeah. today's market with social media and everything else, it's super important to understand that just the post doesn't count. It's like you have to actually have some sort of measurable value prop back to that brand. Yep. There's some small mom and pops that are, they like you, they like what you're doing, they'll send you something or whatever. But if you're looking to make a career out yep. of something like this, you really have to hone your business skills and figure out where your value is. Yeah, if you are just saying I'm fast, there's other fast people. Right. right? If you're just saying you're a great spokesman, there's other great spokespeople. So, I'm I'm about quantitative ROI for endorsement deals, and and if you, you know, if you take that approach and build your business model, and I've been very fortunate to be in corporate America for a very long time and interact with all these brands. I I mean I I told you I've raced for I think every factory, right? So it's been, and it's great because they're all great people. I've had phenomenal relationships with all of them, and uh, that's the trick. You've got to have that B to B. Because if you're just a showman, and, and Ken Block is a great friend, right? He lives in Park City with me. Ken actually is the perfect showman. Right. right? He has figured out with his content creation, all the things, how to take the showman side of business. Travis Strano, another great friend of mine, they've taken the showman side. Right. And now they're great athletes and great performers. And, and so they've complemented being a content creator and a racer to get paid. Right. And they put themselves on the box, right? Right. Um, and if you have that, and you can be the next Travis Pastrana or the next Ken Block, or I mean, I, I, I love what Lauren's doing these days. I mean, there's some there's guys who have figured it out. Yeah, uh, I wasn't that guy. I was just 
I had I knew I was the business side of this, and I want to be a racer. And and, and they had they they had that kind of golden opportunity where they had enough back experience yep. of this industry, and then recognized where it was going with social media and with marketing and media generation and and how you have to put the money up front, right, yep. to to make it happen long tail, and it's paying off for them. Well, I'll tell you. Because Greg Godfrey, who started Nitro Circus, I'll be with Greg later today. Um, he's a good friend, too, from over the years. And, you know, the, the pains and troubles. Like, I was in a bunch of the Thrill Billies and did all the stunts. And I was telling you earlier, I, I do a lot of stunt driving for Toyota and their commercials. And uh, But I watched Greg have his highs and lows on shooting content and all the money you get up front and raising money, you know, going to friends and family because he's going to do this. And he needs to print so many CDs. And then... You know, putting the movies in the theater and having to raise capital and the successes and failures of that and seeing all the friends commit and then Travis starting Nitro Games and, you know, the cost to start Nitro Games and the struggles there and the wins and falls. And it's it's big gambles, right? Yeah. And those guys, that was their approach. I mean, me and Robbie, uh, th these are huge gambles we're doing, right? I mean, right. We sat there and said, hey, we've, we've been being licensors. We've shared intellectual property. Like our last one was Articat. We did that deal with Articat, now Textron. Um, but we're... We're just over it. We're like, hey, you know what? This is our last hurrah, and we're going to design what, what we believe people want to buy and aren't quite sure what they're buying. Like, I walked around Sand Sports Show, and I think I'm damn educated in this business. I looked at so much stuff, and if you didn't give me, like, probably the software, our CAD software, to understand what someone built, visually everything looks great. I walked around out here. This, there's stunning cars. I mean, I, this, this rock crawler out here, without really... That look, thing's crazy. Without really understanding... All the geometry on it, but beautiful work of art. I, yeah. I, I looked at that going, I don't know how well it works, but it sure looks good. And that's a Cowie. That's a Cowie? That's a Cowie. That has Cowie trailing arms and motor plant and all that. Wow. No but clue. you would never know. No. Yeah. That's, that's spectacular. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how it works, right? So right. When you, what's unfortunate is for the consumer is there's so much great looking stuff out there. I'll never get, and uh, God rest his soul, John Marking from Fox was a dear friend of mine, passed away last year. And I never get John sponsored me when I first started racing Class One. In my very first Class One race, we used to when we used to leave the line of, uh, in Ensenada. Once we hopped out of the wash, we only did about two turns on pavement, and the road out of town was 130 miles an hour dirt cliff. Yeah, it was crazy. And John, we used to when we used to register to race back then. Um, your starting position was from your number plate, which was a random draw. So they would, you'd register, they go, hey, Todd, you're 113. Right, so I was the third, right. One cars were 100 numbers, right? So I was the 13th <laughs> off the line. John was 114, and John had just won the championship the year before. Wow. And he was in his brand-new Dominator Jimco, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm going to get <laughs> fucking killed. So I, <laughs> I get ran over. I went to John being this all happy, like I think I was like 32 or whatever. Like I got my first race car, and Tatum Motorsports with Ronco helped me with it. And he said, BFG, all these great People stepped up for me. I have no idea what I was doing. I was a dirt bike guy. Right? I was like, oh. So I go to John to, to comment what happened with that car out there. I went to John. I go, so what do you think? Oh, boy. What do you think? Of, what do you think <laughs> you of opened my, the can of worms. I go, what do you think of my car? And you know, John's a racer. John was an amazing driver. Short course, desert. He's freaking phenomenal. Made some of the best tuning recommendations, shocks anyone ever made. And he's like, what do you mean, what do I think? I'm like, no, what do you think of my car? He's like, I think it's in line in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a guy who just gave me $20,000 in shocks, right? And his only comment is like, you fucking dumb. Get out Sorry. of my way. Get out of the <laughs> It's in front of me, and you're only concerned how pretty it looks. Yeah, you don't yeah. even know if it's good. And it was a great car. Harley Rettner, Harley Lettner and I had that identical chassis. And he also had that beautiful car that I'm bummed he sold, um, the Alpha car. Oh, that yeah. um, when he sold that, I was bummed because that's a, that car was just there. There was no other buggy really like that. And Johnny Kaiser was responsible for building those. Johnny JK is actually a good friend. And there was only three of them. Robbie bought one to go to the car with at one time. Uh, and then RPM ended up with it. And Clyde Stacy ended up with that oh. car. And I don't know where that is today, but there was only two or three total ever built of that car. And Harley said he was never going to sell it. And Harley, if you're listening to this. I sold it like four months ago without telling me, so I was really bummed. Because I was listening to some guys talking about that, not only that car, but just a lot of these original like masterworks of art that really changed the engineering understanding of what we do yeah. in off road that no one knows about. Like they know they've seen it race before, but they don't understand the impact that the that the the proudness of that engineer went through to make that car happen and how that impacted everything down the line. Well, and I'll give Robbie this. If you watch some of the old stuff, you know, when, when Ivan Stewart was racing for Toyota, that was a buggy. Right. That wasn't a truck. 
that was it was bodied as a truck, but it was a transaxle, and the guys who built it were phenomenal guys, but they hadn't figured out how to build a truck yet. They built a buggy and put a truck body on it. So uh, the PPI guys, phenomenal car. Ivan, phenomenal run on it. But when Robbie built a heavy metal truck, you know, Robbie showed up with a truck. A real truck. A, a real <laughs> truck. You know, it was class like a class eight today is what he really showed up in. But that was never been done before, right? And so he had a real truck, and that's why he just ran away from everybody. So that first truck. And then when he built, which is we call it today the Riviera truck that Mark Post owns, you know, that changed the game. That was what the guy, Ricky's going to kill me, Ricky Geyser, and I love you, buddy, but, you know, the guys We're are, all about setting the traps yeah, today. <laughs> just kill them. I'm going gonna, gonna to get beat up all night tonight. But the, the guys are Gen 1. You know, when, when, when the Riviera truck came out, that became the benchmark. And when right. Ricky, Ricky dominated trophy truck building for about a decade, I mean, all the great victories were in Geysers, right? It was, it was not a copy, it was, but it was, people had realized the front engine, four link, you know, uh, trophy truck was where the future was. And Ricky was the first to go, well, the Riviera truck's the benchmark. I'm going to go do what I can do to, to make a better version. And he, did, he made a great one. But if you look at that Riviera truck today, you can go win in it. Larry Rossler and I raced together forever. And Larry's, a, to me, he's my hero still today of everything he does. I think he's 65 with a five-year-old. I don't know how he's doing that. But <laughs> well, props to him. Yeah. <laughs> and and his, wife, his, his wife, Carla, is a, is a wonderful lady as well. Am I still in frame? Yeah. But um, Larry... Every once in a while, Larry will sit there and go, hey, I could go still win in the old truck. Like, the old, the old Herps trucks, the old Land Shock, you give me that truck today, I go still win in it. Like, that's how confident he is in the old technology, right? right? And how simple <clears throat> stuff was back then. You know, at the end of the day, there's four wheels. Right. There's eight shocks, and there's a motor. And unfortunately, it still takes the driver. I don't care how great of a car you get. The road only has so much speed in it. And how fast can you do it? And if, they, right. if we all drive it, the road's max speed. If the if the road has an average speed of 60 and we all can do it, there's not much more we can do. But not everybody can do that. And the thing about endurance racing is you, even if you can do it, some of us can only do it for 20 minutes, two hours, or six hours. And if you look at the guys today, I mean, they're doing it all day. Yeah. They might not be 10 tenths all day, but they're... They're moving. And there's there's been a real push towards the athleticism of racing, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, even with... I mean, that's something... why I'm so fit. <laughs> that's why you're built. <laughs> the, uh, but, I mean, you look at something as simple as, like, Red Bull, right? The investment that they're putting in some, some of these athletes and the, and the, the technology they're bringing to their, their acuity and their responsive times and, and all that stuff, like, it all led to the fact that when the, when the, when the ground's the same ground that the next person rides on... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there is some, there's some luck in, in the luck of the draw on the race course where, when you start getting dusty and when you get, you know, things rutted out and there's some luck there, but, but for the most part, it's the, the ability to understand the risk and reward of every mo move yep. and every throttle change and every break and every, you know, cut it, it, it comes through the hard grind of experience. And if you, you talk about the second piece, so we just, you just narrowed down the driver and the, and the equipment, right? But now the pit crews. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm in the awe. The most uh, overlooked, underappreciated part of racing. It, it is crazy. Well, let's start with the, the, the teams that make sure the car can start the race and finish the race. Yep. If driver makes no mistake. That, that right there is, is a whole other piece of the equation, right? Yep. So that's the prep team. And the crew chiefs. And then you switch over to race day. And, you know, when we started racing, I'd call my buddies and say, hey, I'll buy beer and tacos and hotel rooms. Can you pit my bike program for me? And they, we'd all come pre-run bikes together, and we'd have a blast. And on race day, I, I'll give you a funny story. I, I, there's a road that called the Crossover Road in Baja that goes from kind of like Valley of Trinidad back over to the coast. And a lot of our races use that road. Sometimes we run it um, to the coast. Sometimes we run it back up into the mountains. But usually, you're, you're quite a ways into the race to get there. And again, beers, tacos, hotel rooms, right? <laughs> right. Guys, I just need you at race mile 250 with gas. Just take the RV down there the I'm night chill. before. Just I'm going to need full. Uh, my buggy probably had 70-gallon cell. I don't even know what it had anymore. So just be ready when I come in. And I'm like, I think it was, I think it was at that time, uh, Harley was like, Harley was in second. I was in third. And I think... Uh, all German Motorsports was right behind me, and we were all in each other's dust. And we're already halfway through the race. Right. right? This is Todd, 113, uh, coming over. I'm, I'm five minutes out. And it's mountainy, so sometimes you don't think you can hear. 
Todd, this is one. Todd, 113, uh, Colin, 113, Chase. I, I guys, be ready with gas. <laughs> I'm come mocking down this road. It's this big sweeper, and, and Harley's making dust, and we're all pit there. Everyone pits there. I see Harley pull in. I pull into my pits. No one's there. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are two motorhomes back playing horseshoes. <laughs> Everyone's freaking hammered, right? So I'm laying on the horn, and like finally they come running over. Harley pulls out. All German pulls in. And, uh, and now I'm back to freaking I lost a position. Right. And, you know, I don't know how long it took us to pit. We, they were, my guys pitted with Budweiser. They weren't the best pit crew. Uh, the, our, we had a shirt made one time. If you partied with our, if you partied with our pit crew... You'd be drunk too, or something. I forget what it was. It was such a bad <laughs> sla- saying. It was such, but that race was funny. Well, it, whatever you said earlier, the the beer tacos, it, that just needs to be a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> but that was how you do it. Now, I mean, you watch you watch the top teams with pro uh, with the forced tanks on the the gra- gravity feds. No, and, they're not gravity. And now they're, they're going. Well, that's actually a big argument is on whether they allow that in our sport and you know the the forced the forced flow forced and all that. Yeah. The, the pressure tanks. So if you look at like, I mean, our team I race with, I I, I drive the fly at row, fly at low racing for Wade Porter's trophy truck, and they have they're called pressure pros. So we can put a hundred gallons of fuel in in about I think about twenty seconds. Yeah, not long. It's a four inch hose, <laughs> and it's got maybe I don't I'm, I could be wrong here, but maybe ten psi in the tank, six psi. I don't know how much they use, and it comes out so fast, it's crazy. And then you've got so one pit for us. I think this is right. We have a dead. You have to have a guy, three guys on fuel. So you have to have a dead, deadhead guy on the on the tank. You have to have a guy on the line and a guy on the on the nozzle. So there's three. And normally we only change rears um, most of the race. The fronts are a gamble, and we always have a tentative pit stop for fronts. But the rears are the critical ones. Right. So a rear, you have a jackman. Right. right. That's another one. So there's three on fuel now. A jackman, two guys on each tire. Yep. That's that's an offer. We're at seven. You have a, a crew chief standing there for any mechanicals. That's eight. You get a guy stopping it. It's nine. And you got at least one other guy wiping visors and handing you water or food. Yeah. For 40 seconds. And that's a minimum. Yeah. That's if you want to be competitive. Right. And those guys practice. Like, it's crazy. And we're very fortunate. You race in Mexico a lot. You, we find local so that become part of our pit crews. and oh, They're, that's they're cool. professionals. And they're, they're amazing guys. And we, they come back every time. Tacos, beer. You know? yeah. But on race day... Maybe they have some tacos in there. I'm not sure. <laughs> but they, they're phenomenal. And you watch. We don't practice like that. We practice the, like the couple of days before the race. But you look at the top teams these days, that what they're doing, and they're running like a NASCAR program. These guys, are they're practicing their pit stops. or They're practicing what has to happen with driver changes. Like It's funny. My, my trophy truck uh, that I drive has an Albans ST6 in it. And I'll tell you something interesting about that. There's no park. <laughs> right right there's no park right so you you have to if you used to drive in a turbo 400 when you come to a pit stop you slam it and you take can care put of it in park and you're good well yeah here if you're not careful well, not in a pit stop but maybe on the side of the trail in a flat like if you watched what happened to robbie in the baja 1000 last year the team no names that had it second on his truck they got a flat four miles after getting the truck from robbie they hmm. get out of the truck put on the jack Truck rolled off and <laughs> truck wanted to finish the race. Yeah, it, it, went, it, went, it went, it went, it went 200 yards down the down the road and into a ditch because there's no there's no parking no park. Break. You have to be so aware of all these things. So practicing it and the level of competition to be there, it's it's just it's it's an unbelievable where a sport's gone. My fear and my excitement. My fear is I don't think you're going to see the the trophy truck class. Um, I mean, look, class one's almost gone, right? And I I think you're going to see the trophy truck class slowly be unaffordable for most um i'm helping a team this thousand i might have to race two trophy trucks this thousand and uh i had no idea and thanks to my sponsor i had no idea what a 40 inch tire cost i've never bought paid one paid for one <laughs> right they're 900 or 850 dollars yeah. delivered yeah add a 500 hundred dollar wheel to that so every or more yeah or more if it's that's a cast wheel right. cast speed lock forget a and everybody's going to forge. forge so so you could have two thousand. Let's just make it easy. Fifteen hundred dollars a wheel and tire, on each on each pit stop, which is for a two wheel drive about every two hundred and twenty five, two hundred fifty miles. So above a thousand, that's eight wheels and tires. So that's what is that? Fourteen thousand dollars in wheels and tires. If you don't smuggle fuel into Mexico, and we do not smuggle fuel into Mexico, <laughs> not um, crossing that line. You have to. You're already paying. You're paying almost fifteen dollars a gallon for like late model plus, right? right? 
And that's if they have it. They ran out last they ran, time. They ran out. I just saw that. Yeah. yeah. I actually just ordered our late model plus. I'm like, we cannot have you out of that. But if you if you realize a trophy truck is sub two, uh, a two-wheel drive so trophy truck is sub two miles a gallon. So you need 400 gallons. All you guys that just hauled your stuff across the country this, this weekend <laughs> complaining about seven miles per gallon. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, the benefit of a, a four-wheel drive actually is fuel economy. <laughs> it actually almost doubles. Right. And less you, tire spin. And no tire spin. And the tires don't burn out. Yeah. You know, I know uh, there's a really good article on what Bryce did. Bryce um, has a ton of telemetry in his truck and bef on his two-wheel drive car. And, again, I'm recreating the storyline without getting it 100%. <laughs> or someone's going to go, oh, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm like, and okay, the well. community's used to doing yeah. stuff like that. But Bryce <laughs> has telemetry. He was, I believe he averaged 70% throttle or 80% throttle in Vegas to Reno in his two-wheel drive truck. And his tires traveled 700 miles or something like that. Right. Yeah, 480 <laughs> right. mile race, 500 miles, but his tires traveled 700. In his four-wheel drive, he averaged like 30%, and his tires traveled like 500 miles, 20 miles more than the course. So the reason we That's also... That's actually really good. Really good. And yeah. it shows you how much more kind you are. Well, he's in a bigger motor too, so that changes a little bit, and, and now a six-speed. But, and, uh, and the transmissions, the way how far they've come is, is yeah. crazy. So yeah, I mean, the forever having a gearbox like I have in my truck, everyone BJ Baldwin tried. Everyone tried to perfect uh, paddle shifting. Yeah, and BJ pulled it out, and a lot of guys just gave up on paddle. Like I don't have paddle. I shift the I shift that six speed uh, sequential manually. I don't have any air shifting on mine. But now you watch all the teams, and they have it down to a science. Yeah, and it's actually safer on the trainee now to use paddles. Back then, you just could never shift it. But now, it's so precise. Because if I miss a gear, I'll sit on top of the dogs and I'll bounce on, a, right. on them, you know? So, it's, it's, you got to be really careful. But driving buggies, that's all we ever had. So, a little bit more used to it than I think most. So, I don't know. That's so, so, when you take your perspective of this history of, of racing, and, 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 I, and we've talked before on the podcast with other guys about how Moto really does influence a better race program when you go from Moto to four wheels. Yeah. And and how you how you approach lines and how you how you you contemplate and and, and predict stuff, uh, way different than if you just jump straight into four wheels. Um, yeah. And uh, and when you talk about doing this this last um, kind of like hurrah thing with Speed UTV, um, what were those discussions like when you said when when Robbie and you were sitting down and saying we want to do this, we actually want to move forward with this? How did that all influence what you're going into making a four wheel car? Well, I don't know if you guys know, like, Robbie raced for Team Green, too. I mean, Robbie was a phenomenal dirt bike rider. Um, actually shattered both his ankles, and that was the end of it. And then went into lucky to be able to go race for Ford and Trans Am and all that he did. But I think I think two things happened uh, over the years. You know, I think you, you start understanding that, you know, us were business people, and you're like, where's the market going, right? And unfortunately, as much as I love dirt bikes, it, they don't sell a lot. Right. You know, when, when Bubba Stewart... They have a long, long tail. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like you're replacing it every three years. They have a very, very long shelf life. For most people who don't ride a lot. A lot of this is like, oh, I got it. Now I don't, I'm scared of it type stuff. But when I was racing for Cowie, Bubba Stewart was racing for Cowie. Um, Bubba was making uh, seven, I think, seven million a year racing for Cowie. Now, that was, in, that was victory schedule. That was salary. There's a bunch of things. Actually... Kawasaki, and I don't think I'm screwing up on an NDA because it's so long, long ago, but Cowie would insure Bubba's victory schedule because they couldn't afford it. So they, they would go, and <laughs> they'd sit there, and they'd go, hey, Lloyd's of London, we have $2 million in victory schedule that we can afford. But to get Bubba, we, he needs 7 or $5 because they probably have a $2 million contract. Can you insure? Because he's still going to win them. So you guys run the odds on him winning – five million dollars in victory schedule right and they had to they would take an insurance policy out and the, the insurance company paid the victory schedule so the year that like he won everything you know kawasaki did, had a huge savings for them but they they won it so but that where we're getting at was that seven million dollars you know they only sold seven thousand dirt bikes in north america that year that's crazy so a million what a if you do the math on that it's like a hundred or ten thousand dollars i think it is a dirt bike it cost in marketing dollars to hire Bubba Stewart to sell 7,000 bikes. They, right. didn't, they didn't make any money on it. But their answer to me was, well, we do it to build our brand. Right. So Robbie and I have built the brand Speed. 
over the years. More Robbie than me. Uh, mostly Robbie than me. I mean, so I'll give hey, him Robbie, all once again, I'm letting him take <laughs> that. <laughs> but, um, you know, Robbie and I have been doing business for six years. We've known each other uh, for 20, right? We've been business partners for maybe, maybe eight years. I don't know how long now. But um, so we, we have this, this, this brand speed. And so if you look at what Kawi did, they're going to build a brand. We built this brand, and, and we, we licensed it to everybody over the years. You know, everybody had, to, had a piece of it. Um, and so from energy drinks to tools to RC cars to you name it, from stadium super trucks, everything we've done, we've built this, this great uh, lifestyle product. Um, and that's what our industry is, lifestyle product. Then we said, okay, we don't want to, we want to now say, after what happened with uh, Articat and Tracker, uh, Articat and Textron, sorry, like, you know what, we're, we're done licensing. And, and we are just going to go build it and bring it to market. And, uh, and we've, I think for, from what my experience in power sports was in motorsports and what Robbie had, the two of us combined on, on chassis and then, and, and then vendor supplying, being able, to, being able to buy the right product. It's so easy to buy the wrong product. One thing we did, there's only two SKUs on our car that we don't, didn't design, didn't make. We didn't make the stereo and we didn't make the rugged radio kit. That's it. Everything from the wheels, the tires, the beadlock, that whole car is... 30 years of Robbie's and my knowledge to say, what's the best thing to do here? What's the best partner? Who, who are we going to hire to, to manufacture our lights? Who are we going to hire uh, to, to manufacture our tires? And in all this sourcing that you have to do, there's 28,000 unique parts on that car. Yeah, yeah. And some, it's a nut and bolt. So you might get, you know, a thousand nuts and bolts from someone. But if you go look inside a motor, valve train, who are you buying the rods from? Who are you buying the, the valves from? Who are you buying the valve seats from? The springs? And who's, who's nickel sill in the cylinders? Who's boring the cylinders? What machine shop's doing this? I mean, it's, that's just the damn motor. Right. right? And, and I remember, you know, the initial discussions that, you know, like the Sandsport show and all those initial, like, uh, pipe dream type discussions back then, uh, you know, the scope of thought process around that was, you know, to get this off the ground, maybe there are partners we can work with to to utilize the speed of the development on this, right? And there's been, like you were saying, you've worked with manufacturers in the past and you've done that work before. Um, and then at some point there was a transition of like, we have to do this ourselves. Yeah, so what happened is, little by little, you get caught up in supply chain. <clears throat> and supply chain is really what's what was a problem with COVID. Supply chain during COVID wasn't a problem for us, but we realized, okay, when we worked with Articat, Yamaha told Articat, making up a number, we're only going to sell you 2,500 motors a year. And we're not going to sell you turbo motors for two years, and we're making up the time frame and dollars and stuff, but you're only going to get turbo motors that only make so much horsepower. So they kept getting hand, uh, handcuffed right. on what they were able to do. And we're like, well, that's not how we want to run our business. I don't, I don't want to build this great company, and then my power... So my engine supply says I can only do so much. You don't and, want somebody writing the script of your story right. before you even start. And that, unfortunately, if you look around, many people rely uh, on in this industry. I mean, it happened during, during COVID. Um, I believe it was Can-Am and Polaris. The Fox Ride Command shocks were yeah. not available. Those cars nor, all, nor the chips for the Ride Command. Right. So those, they sat. Yeah. No one could and And... What happened with Fox, if I remember this right, is Ford with the Raptor said, hey, we'll buy everything. Right. Yeah. And I'll, make, I'll tell you a funny story. I learned that, and I was working with Kicker on our car, and this new amp, that's why our car sounds so damn good, is the amp that Kicker made. It's got a great Kicker sub and speakers and everything, but it's really the amp. And they said, hey, Todd, you know, this amp, we only have 2,500 of these, and we need to get it out to all our partners. Right. And then in two years, we'll have mass production, we'll build more. And I said, why do you want to give every partner five amps? Right, every Audio Express or I don't know who the, who the car installers are. I said, why do you want to do that? Because all they're going to do is call you every day, going, "I need more." Everyone loves it. I said, just sell them all to me. Sell me every amp you have. I'll buy every one of them, and then go build more. Right, and then roll it out properly instead of teasing the whole industry with something. I'll buy everything. Your whole business model is I'm not paying any less than the guys that you're selling to. So I just bought them all. So come back out with something else. And so that's what I did. After I learned what, what Ford did with Fox, I'm like, I'll just buy everything. And what Robbie and I have done is we realize if we don't control supply chain, eventually we could be waiting on it. Like Articat was waiting on an air filter this year. Couldn't ship a car. They have an air filter. So we just, if we're not in supply chain, so supply chain is when it's a commodity that everybody buys. Right. That's truly called supply chain, or that's what I've learned. When you just source your own product, you're not in the supply chain world. You're just in the sourcing world. You give someone a diagram, you go get it quoted, and you go get it manufactured, and you try to make sure you have an A, B, and C supplier for backup and redundancy, right? So the, be it that they, they build a poor quality product or they, 
they have cash flow issues themselves or whatever that supplier A is your number one guy, but if he can't get it done, you have B and C and building all those redundancies into your business. So if you were always just relying on a shock manufacturer, the only option is to change. And let me tell you, changing shocks mid-year, going from Fox to Elka. Elka is another great shock out there at Walker Evans. They've already tooled up for everybody else. There's nothing left. Right. We didn't want to. We were small enough that we thought we would be uh, somehow either managed out of the supply chain. <laughs> Due to, That's a nice way of saying it. Due to, <laughs> due to powerful purchasing, right? Um, and we just didn't want to have that. And you know, that's that's a lot of the knowledge that Rob and I have from over the years of, of being in, in corporations and working. I mean, worked for Fortune 500 companies and done a lot of stuff. So you kind of learn all these things that are they're tricky. And uh, so when we talk about getting the supply and demand, the demand for the supply figured out, and especially when you're going into building a ground up car. And we we look at something like the shocks, right? Something that is so Robbie so passionate about making right. Yep. Um, and that goes into the motor. That goes into some various different things. Um, you know, what was like kind of the discussion? What was the environment around? Like, we could spend a third the price, just wait longer, versus all that R and D, all that investment in in CAD, all that investment engineering, and and then finding somebody that can do it to the expectation level, like. There's there's a there's always a discussion around we're gonna save so much money by doing this if we just wait versus we're also gonna spend the same amount of time to do it ourselves. You know it's funny I don't know if we had those we had the oh shit that's not gonna work we can't buy it we need to do it ourselves uh, or I'll give you an example we thought we had the best clutch before tap we thought we had this amazing clutch it had an airbag in it so you could change the spring rate with an airbag all this new technology. Put on never worked. Yeah. And that's why we ended up with tap and it's been phenomenal. So And shout out to tap. I yeah. mean Oh God. And Alan, I I think he's here. I think he's probably at our booth now. But my my God, those guys are just been phenomenal. And you drive our car, it drives like you it drives like your 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 truck. If it doesn't have that herky jerky off the line, it's just like it has a torque converter in it and it just rolls off the line and you don't feel back shift. You don't feel anything. It feels like you're driving a car. And it's so stinking fast. It's crazy. And I mean, the whole concept behind their clutch in the first place was just the tunability and the flexibility of it. Um, and when you guys approached, I'm assuming you approached them to work with them to get to this technology moving forward. Or You're going to love those phone calls. They're, they're a small <laughs> company out of Canada, right? Right. Right. Hi, well, uh, I mean, their initial videos was just him in his garage or whatever. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, this is Robbie and Todd. And uh, we heard you make a good clutch. Right, um, we're in a we're in a bind. Our, our clutch isn't performing to the way it's supposed to. And um, here's our spline. Uh, we'll take ten. Right. And can you during COVID, where you're not allowed to cross the border, <laughs> can you cross the border and spend two weeks and have us do testing with us? Yeah. And they figured out how to cross the. They called whoever they had to call. They crossed the border. Sorry, I broke my neck a couple times. Just oh looking, no, sorry about that. <laughs> I gotta look uh, at you, not away from me, but uh. Yeah, and phenomenal. And that clutch, I mean, when you realize what you're getting in our car compared to uh, like a team or whatever, I mean, they're, they're just stunning. Their works of art, and they work unreal. Um, so, are, so, I mean, I'm aware of everything that is going on speed, but but the, the actual tap clutch that you're using, you guys used their actual full development clutch during the development of the car. Is that the same clutch that's going on, or is it like the Speed UTV approved geometries and, and weighting and all that that's going into that clutch, like a like a Speed version of it that's going into the car? Um, I think I'll answer. I think I'll answer your question here. So, tap clutch that you can go buy today, right? Um, I we took that clutch. Um, Alan and his team came down and weighted and sprung it and tuned it and cammed it and do whatever they do with the cam arms and. Apologize. I mean, yeah. I ride snowmobiles. I should know all this stuff, but <laughs> that thing's really intricate and actually incredibly easy to use. But they did all the tuning on it. And then we took that and we added a lot. It has the fans for cooling. It has the bearings so we can run the clutch cover so we don't have any torsional flex on the clutches, which is what fries belts. On the, on the primary bolt that it yeah. sits on, there's a now a, a bearing there in the casing to support it. Right. So we added, actually, I invented that 20 years ago. Uh, I, I ran on that, that UTV I was telling you about. I ran like a torsion bar. Oh, yeah. I didn't run it in the clutch cover. We just had a tin clutch cover to come right. off for us. But I made longer bolts, put bearings, and put a torsion bar and bolted back in to make that in double shear. That's why we never lost a belt in that race. And when I told Robbie about that, and I actually still had that old car. I had it brought to the Charlotte shop. I'm like, hey, look at this. This is what we, oh, wow. do. This is what we have to do to our car. We'll never have a belt issue. And we don't. The belts, 
I mean, and I, that's that's what you were saying now with racing in UTVs is that all the high horsepower cars have gone to that bar setup. Have they? Yeah. Yeah. We've taught a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, so little by little, um, little by little, we evolved our car from failures, right? Or from being approached with, hey, this might be a thing. Like we worked, we were going to work with um, maybe Delphi or Mitsubishi or you know, you name it. The the ECUs are in all these cars and. We just sat there like we want to be the first car to have uh, an EPA approved two tunes. I want it. We why not? I mean, the the motor can make the horsepower. Why don't we give it to the customer? And and it's and honestly, it's a great profit center for us because once we developed it all and right. spent all the capital, right. I can sell tunes. Yeah, they're software. It's it's a software button right now. So if you look at like an EVP, they're phenomenal. They're great guys. They're friends of ours. But I was like, well, there's a whole business there of people tuning, right? But if you could go get a tune from the factory, right? Wouldn't you just run that one? For the performance-minded factory versus a consumer like mass market product right. thought process. So now you just hit the button, put E85 in, you get 300. So we needed a great computer to that, and the, the, all those other ones didn't work. So went to Mtron, who is like a MoTeC competitor. Yep. And uh, said, hey, give us your Mtron, the one that you can go buy today for like three grand, whatever that one is. Then we figured out how to run our car in, in, in the two modes on it. And then we said, okay, we don't need all this other stuff that the guys racing and need for CAN bus data, all the different things that every, when you look at an ECU, there might be 70 items in that ECU to make up that board, right? right. And every one of those, one cost 500 bucks, one cost 50 bucks. And so you just, we just said, what are we using? Right. And then dumb those down and then we can make our own board. And Entrum did all of it for us, but we just said, okay, you don't need that chip or you need this chip. We made our own housing. But now we have you know, the most... So you have uh, a full-out custom Mtron ECU. Yeah. Most state-of-the-art ECU in power sports. Unbelievable. And, and for, it has data logging and has CAN. I mean, if you look at our wire... So it's an accessible car, ECU, which is not something in our industry that you can find from the factory. Uh, it's it's a read only. You, you won't be able to tune it. It's, well, and, and that goes back to like the legal hurdles that you yes. have to go through and all that, right? Like that's I mean, just, someone's going to break it. Someone's sure. going to do something. Yeah. But the point is, is that you do have a lot of those features built in straight from the get go. Where on like a Polaris or a Can-Am or something, you'd have to hack the ECU to get into that data, yeah. that data stream, right? And so, so being performance minded manufacturing, you're saying we know that customer wants this. Let's just we'll do it, it from them. the get go. Yep, and give them the confidence that the one we built, because we had to pass EPA with it, right? right? We had to pass the tune so that it's a reliable, high horse. I don't know who's going to ever use that damn tune. This car, <laughs> I, I, I... It just speaks to the performance-minded uh, backing of the company that says, we understand our customer, right? Yep. And, and so how do you guys approach that? How do you do that research to get like more familiar with your, with your clients? Um, we don't do any of that. Uh, I, I've been part of know your customer thing. I've sat with all these meetings and all these board meeting stuff. And it's, and it's funny, Richard Branson made a post the other day. He's like, I, he's, he's doing master classes now. He's a, fun, <laughs> he's a funny guy. And, and he's, I'm big into kite surfing. So he's got this, he's got this Island. Todd, what are you not into? Uh, I'm going to be very careful. With, with Losing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> but he, he's a funny guy. And my buddy, my buddy wraps all his airplanes and submarines, this guy, uh, Eric Bond. And uh, so getting to know him and to see that he's doing this master class stuff. And, is, and he said, no, I, you know, we don't have board meetings and we don't, we don't, we do everything out of the boardroom. That's why we're successful. And I me and Rob, there's no board meetings. It's two guys who spend way too much time on the phone. My wife calls Robbie, my girlfriend, and, uh, <laughs> but where I was, where I was going with it is that, the, the ideas that, that have allowed us to understand our customer is the, the philosophy that we've always had. If, would we buy it? If I would buy it, I'll sell it. And honestly, I, I apologize to a lot of uh, the people maybe listening because some people might not buy what we sell. And they're like, hey, can you make a 64-inch or can you make a non-turbo? We can. And maybe one day we will. But today, when we started our company, the philosophy was, would we drive it? Would we buy it? Right. And I think that's, that's the, to, to stick to your passion and to, and to be true to it is, you know, we can do the cliche saying that that's your recipe for success, but it, it, it doesn't guarantee success. No. Right. But, but this, this investment of your, of your, basically your life in the, at this point has to be driven by some sort of recognition that you do have a community of buyers that, that believe the same thing as you do. Yep. We just looked at the aftermarket industry is the reason UTVs have been successful. What are people turning their car into? And why don't we just go build up from the get-go? 
So right. we did listen to the customer, and our customer is predominantly the seven western states, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, Oregon, Washington. I'm missing something. There's, yeah. That wasn't seven, but... So um, when we talk about aftermarket, right, yeah. that's, you know, the, the forums and stuff, we, we all know that they, they love to talk about Speed UTV, right? Yeah. So, so when we talk about... I think about... we crush the forums. I think we're, <laughs> for, for somebody who hasn't shipped a car to a soul, we dominate the conversations. It's wonderful. <laughs> so, so when you talk about the aftermarket, right, and, and, and part of your goal is to make a car that doesn't need it, but at the same time, how do you approach the aftermarket when everyone claims that you're anti-aftermarket, right? Like, how do you guys approach that with the selling point of the car? Okay, so I'm going to ask you these questions. This is the best ever, because I, I get this and I never understand it. And, and this is a, a discussion that I'm no. always talking with people about, and so yeah. I understand that people don't understand yeah. this part of it, and I would like to, to maybe clarify that. So I, today, I told you, I, I just come back from dirt bike riding. So yep. Damon Cardone, do you remember who Damon is? Damon owned Hardcore Racing, HCR. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah Special yeah. kit company. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, we're talking, because he sold, and he's, now he lives up here, and the guy's a damn good dirt biker. That's what pisses me off for <laughs> Fat old bastard. He still crushes me on a dirt bike. I'm just saying. Oh, uh, you can hear that one, I'm gonna put a, that I'm going to put day. a permanent disclaimer yeah. along the bottom of the I'm, screen. I'm, I'm, I'm just stepping on everyone's toes today. <laughs> but he's a great guy. He's a long-winded talking friend, but he's a spectacular guy, and we were talking business, because we, we used to work together. When I owned, when I owned Dragonfire, you know, we were right. competitors, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, actually, back then... Instead of being competitors, I'm like, hey, Damon, how about I help finance your company by you build me my suspension? I'll give you the drawings, but you're a builder. Like, that's what you're set up for. So I'll give you all my drawings. You build me my kits. And he had, he had all the lasers and water jets and the press brakes and all that stuff. So I, was, I always try to give back to the industry. And let, I mean, I was an aftermarket company, right? So I always look at people say, well, no one can build for, for speed. There's no accessory can build for speed. And I always sit there going, okay. Oh, it brings in Damon. When Polaris and Can Am came out with 72s, I'm like, is the business done? He's and, like, and, we, and like even me and Brandon Twitch, right? right. We, we've talked about that. Uh, but he said, no, we're selling more kits than ever because you know why? They don't have to sell axles and shocks anymore. A kit back in the day was 7500 bucks, right? Now you're just buying rear links and, and an upper and lower control arms. Right. So it, now when you think about it, the guy goes and buys a Can Am and... I don't know what HCR kit costs. Say it's forty five hundred bucks, but now he gets a boxed kit, not a not a cast or a stamped or whatever. He gets a real kit. So he goes, no, we've, the new company who acquired him. He goes, no, we sell more than ever, and the margin isn't as good as it used to be. But right. since there's so much more volume, they make more money. The demand's up. Yeah. So he's like, so it's been great. So no one gives Can Am and Polaris grief for building a seventy two car. So. But I think I think people's argument is the the licensing problem that that people have experienced. Give me one give me one accessory. Well, I mean it it, you, it comes from the the fact that our industry is driven so hard by small mom and pops, right? And then they look at something like Articat and the failure of the aftermarket to really push that car forward. I'm going to disagree with you. That car failed um, because Articat didn't build any. That's true. There wasn't very much supply there. They didn't build any for the last two years. I still get paid. I get my roller report. They just started building cars again last quarter. Right. Uh, they tried to sell off all their dealers uh, and make it be a tracker product, which you, a retail guy could buy it from Tracker cheaper than the dealer could buy it from Articat. From Articat. All right, they just they had a, a whole different business model. The failure on that car, and then everyone said, hey, the, you, can't buy, you can't build suspension. You know what? You can't build an axle. So the, the, the thing about that car was the, the design of the dual plunge axle, which is on the new Speed UTV, is the only thing that makes trailing arms work. If you do not have the, the, the dual plunging axle... To compensate for the, the movement the up movement. and down. That's why Can-Ams and Polaris's with a five link can do this. Ours go up and down straight, so now it has to plunge in the axle, right? right. We have the patent on that. And I tell everybody... Articat did it. They went out and made their own. They tried to circumvent our patent. Their axles were junk. They never worked. They had the highest failure rate on axles. That's one of the car actually struggled a little bit because they had, they had such a failure rate on axles, there was no consumer confidence, right? But I, we told everybody, go take the time, go, go spend the millions that Robbie and I did and go build an axle. Right. If you can build one that works, you're fine. But no one ever did. Because unfortunately, mom and pops and companies, they don't have it. And honestly, Articat didn't build enough cars to justify inventing that much. So... What else couldn't they build? Right. You, you can go build light bars. You can go build roofs. You can go build bumpers. You can go build wheels and tires, fire extinguishers, sound systems, skid plates. Build whatever you want. So right. they all said that we stopped them from building everything. They stopped themselves. They used the excuse of our patent on the suspension 
But really, that w the suspension isn't the leader in aftermarket. If you come out here and look around, hardcore racing and long travel industries, they're like probably the two premier aftermarket long travel companies. And HDR, yeah. The HDR is hardcore racing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't thinking straight. They're not even on display here, right? They have, they have a, tra a trailer here, but they're they out do? shooting content. And okay, stuff. But the big pr things here is rugged radios and... I mean, whips, right? Light bars. I mean, Baja Designs is here. Shocks, Elka Suspension is here. The Shock OEs therapy are here. And all Shock Therapy, guys. they're all here. All these great brands are here. So our car is going to be the same. There's really, you're not going to buy my car and take my suspension off. I, that would, you can. I don't know why you right. would do it. It's all box, TIG, welded, chrome, so poly plate. I think the, un, the, the, the answer to everybody's arguments is that you have patents, yeah. or Robbie has patents, that are specific to that part. And if you can make a better one, go build it. Then patent it and build it. Yeah. And that's what I think people misunderstand the the purpose of patents, right? Like you've licensed patents to other companies, and if it makes financial sense to do so, you guys are more than willing to do it. But if you're going to build a car, a solution that doesn't have to be upgraded, that's where your mindset's at. Oh yeah. So when we said our thing was build what people are buying, right? So we just said we're going to go build what is the best. Am I still in front? Yeah. In our opinion, what's the best, right? And that's what we did. And a lot of it, you know, hey, I, I rode for KMC for 10 years, right? They make great wheels and tires. They're going to probably be tons. Heck, our paddle tire setup uses a cage wheel, all right? So there's, there's tons of people who might switch out our wheel, and they might switch out our tire, or they might say, hey, these are great wheels and tires. They have the right geometry. And what we built when we built our tire, and our, I'm sorry, our wheel, is you can change the face. So cosmetically, right. At the aftermarket, if they were smart, they would start designing faces. Right. Because well, every and, face can be I don't think people browser. understand that wheel. Yeah. I think they just see a wheel on a car and just like, oh, it's another beadlock. No. That wheel is way different than your beadlock that you'd go buy from any yeah. vendor on Vendor Row. Yep. It's not a beadlock ring that holds a tire on. It's a whole face. So we, Which we, makes it stronger, too. Oh, phenomenally stronger, right? And, yeah. and what's really cool is at the dealership now, you're able to go in, and instead of the dealer stacking wheels that are 7 inches to 10 inches wide, taking up inventory, it's going to be a half inch. I don't know how wide that, that wheel right. face is. And they can have all these different designs. And if you want a forged one that's anodized, like the aftermarket can go build anything they want for that. It's just a circle with holes in it. Right. right? It's just a wheel face. Um, tires, you know, hey, Tenzer tires, BFG, Toyo, there's all great Tens. ITP, I mean, those guys are sponsoring me. There's, do you want to run it, though? Like, or do you just want to run the speed tire? Because if you already have five, and this is part of our business model, right? A lot of people, when they buy our car, since it actually holds a spare, right? Yeah, the, the, the spare carrying in the bed is awesome. So most of our customers bought a fifth tire from us. So now what are you going to do? You're going to go, when you get one flat, are you going to go buy more speed tires or right. are you going to go switch over to Tensor? So our goal was not not to stop people from buying, but give them a solution that makes them not want to buy elsewhere. You know, our light bars, the way they integrate, uh, they're phenomenal. I, I raced for Allen at Baja Designs for a decade. A phenomenal product, in my opinion. Probably, and hey, Taylor and Seth Anderson from Rigid are dear friends. I knew those guys. I actually used to work with Seth and Taylor for a while. I used to run Dragonfire out of their hardware, <laughs> their chrome hardware bolt company. I, I leased the warehouse space from those guys. That's how good friends they are. Um, those are the, there might be Nolan, Casey Highlights. So like There's some great brands. But at the end of the day, a light bar, is it IP67? Is it the right length? And what is the lumen and what is the bulb? Does it use a Cree, OLED? Did you build the right extrusion on the heat exchange? Do you have the right bar? And what type of lumen levels does it does? And that's light bar business. So at the end of the day, we said, we're going to be in the light bar business. You know, we're going to build the best, brightest light bar we can. We read everybody's facts, just like we've told everyone, go read up on our car. Go figure out what you can build. So we read up on Baja Designs and, and Rigid and Casey Highlights and everybody. We said, okay, we need, making up a number, 70,000 lumens out of 50-inch bar, if that's what it is. I don't have no idea. And let's make sure we get that. Let's make sure our heat exchange, let's make sure it's IP67 so we don't have water issues. Let's do that. Let's go build the best sound system. Let's not just build another automotive sound system that people are okay with. Let's just make it blow people's minds, right? So we worked with Kicker. Um, and that was our approach. So at the end of the day, there's everything on this car people can build accessories for. I just don't know why you would. Right. And I, and I think that's what uh, people don't understand is that, the, like you alluded to earlier, about being more of a lifestyle brand, right? Uh, you're you're bringing your race history, your 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 Baja history, your racing uh, prowess into an identifiable brand, right? Like if you're a speed speed fan, 
you're a, you're an off-road desert racer, you know, Baja fan, right? And you probably like tacos and beer, right? Yes. So, so I think that approach is so drastically different than corporate UTV manufacturing, where it's all about let's identify this niche and then advertise to it, yep. right? And and convince them to buy our product. Whereas your your company is saying we already have a community that just wants the best that we can put out. That's it. And I think that's where your approach is different and why people are scared to identify with it because they're maybe they're not Baja people. Maybe they're Northwest Michigan people, which is a different, completely class of product. Very different. You might even be able to, you might need a 56 wide car, right? There's right. all these things. So we started our company uh, at the top and we're working into other models as we progress saying, at least we know we'll be profitable and build a car that has a reputation of, of a great car, right? We're not gonna win every race. We're gonna be on our lid. We're gonna be on a toe strap just like everybody else. It happens, right? They're still mechanical items. Um, but if we built the best and you take that, build a, build a marquee vehicle first and then follow, we'll eventually have a, an incredibly well-rounded power sports company. But if, uh, if we just say, hey, we're gonna build three models with three different variations and that's all we really wanna do because the, 80 or 100 dealers I have, that's they're fine with it. And we sell enough cars that it makes me and Robin, I'm 52, Rob's 53. You know, how, how much more do we need to do in our career path? We're not, we're not chasing dollars. We're, not, we're chasing happiness at this point, right? So if the business is successful and we can continue to make those models better, right? And keep evolving them and people just keep buying them. Remember, Polaris is going to sell hundreds of thousands of cars a year, right? Probably at least 150, 200,000 between snow and everything, watercraft, everything they build. I can go sell 12,000 cars a year and we'll do a billion dollars. Right. right? A, a billion, I mean, I've never even thought, I mean. It's, it's back to that 250,000 of something. Yeah, I don't, a billion's a lot. And, uh, <laughs> and we just wanna have fun and we wanna build the best and we want to be engaged. Like right. our race programs are ours. Like I'd love to go see and Rob does this a lot, but like go see, and Craig Scanlon was a great example. Craig raced, right? And he led that brand. But in general, most leaders aren't out there racing. You're gonna see me and Rob, we're, we're, we're going back to full-time racing. We just said, you know what, the, the so right that, thing to that do. That brings me to a, the, uh, an idea that I had, and, and maybe you can confirm this, is that this idea of building a car, not only for others, but that it has like a place for you. Like you wanna build the car you wanna race. You don't wanna be relying on this other platform. And in, in UTV racing and just like other classes, you have to have a manufactured car. Um, is there a little bit of that that goes into like the future, the last leg of my career in this racing scene? I want it to be what I define it as. I think uh, there's one other variable. It's, it's this young gun called Max. <laughs> and, uh, and, and obviously Max is Robbie's son, but I, I, I think dearly of that kid and he's an amazing young uh, driver, amazing young man. And, uh, and how well composed is he? You know, he's, and let me tell you where he's gone in the last three years with composure. Uh, it's it's very tricky to be Robbie Gordon's kid and go to school because <laughs> you look at how we get picked on on the forums. For I can't imagine right now you're you're that guy's kid, so you're the loved, hated, or you know whatever. That's that's the that's where we live. Uh, that's why I live in Park City. <laughs> and my kids are into ski racing. <laughs> no, no, I hide me. I hide in our little bubble up there. But um, the. Our goal is to give Max everything to make sure he takes on this. So that's why we bought the Havasu. Well, Robbie bought the Havasu building. Um, so Max has a business to learn. That's, if you know the coins down there in, in uh, El Centro. Coin Power Sports. Coin Power Sports. Marty and Travis are friends. And that's what Marty did. And so Robbie learns a lot from his peers. So Marty coin, built Coin Power Sports um, and put Travis in there. Travis was a phenomenal trophy truck racer, a great truck course racer, raced Pro 4. Um, Hey, here's your power sports company. So now you have you have a dealership to start Max off in. You have a racing career. We've got him in UTVs, and he's already racing SSTs. He's one of the faster guys in an SST. At 16, he'll be in a trophy truck, so it's only a couple years away. And you'll see him progress. And you know, me and Rob talk every day. It's like, how much money can we make and make sure that kid races F1? It, he, you look at him today, and if we can get him to race the cars at 90%, I think you'll see him start winning stuff. I mean, I hope he wins lawful this week. I mean, how many times has, has discussions with Robbie about, you know, wins and losses and all that stuff come down to the fact that he's not running the car he wants to run? That's it. You that know what car, I mean? That car disappoints him every time. And 
So we're like, okay, we're not going to rely on on this motor. We're not going to rely on that steering rack. We're not going to rely on on this ECU that times out because it gets hot. Everything that happens with true production cars, right? right? So we said we'll build a production car, but we're going to build it as a race car. We're going to make it safe. We're going to have everything, all the right stuff out of the box, and we're going to give ourselves, our customers, and and Max the tools to go win. Yeah, and out I, of the box. And I think that is evident when you look at things like hydro steering and yes. and all that. I mean, that's. That is the storyline right there, right? Is yeah. is each each of those decisions came out of like we're done having to put up with these roadblocks and yeah. we're just going to replace them with what we believe is the best solution. And that's that's the whole business. So uh, we still have. I tell Robbie he wants he'll kill me for this one. I told him like a week or two ago because we start shipping cars, which is everyone's question. We start shipping cars here like right around Thanksgiving, um, and I said, you know, building a car was the easy part, and that he wanted to kill me. <laughs> I'm like you have no idea. I go. You think you think you get getting hate now because you're nine months late on a car or you know whatever you told them they were gonna get a front bumper and now they can't or whatever whatever you know whatever whatever has progressed as as we've grown the business. I said people are gonna have the car, right? And then and, the real fun starts. And the fun is gonna start. <laughs> Someone's gonna call and they're gonna say, hey, I I my my buddy borrowed my car and it just broke and you look at it and like the wheels are ripped off the car right you get those right the it fell off the trailer and it fell apart and i right. hate you right and then you're gonna have the post of the guy who owns the competitive car when the when our car is on a strap right and you don't know why it's on a strap right but it's on a strap and right and you're gonna have the guy that wants to go to the dunes this weekend and he popped a tire and you didn't mail it to him in time and he missed his trip and you know the you know, you missed or something just on assembly. you didn't meet their expectation of whatever the expectation was. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you can't. We're the one thing is we're approachable and accessible. I think half my customers have my personal phone number. There's a lot of customers. You know, we got. I think we've sold four. Evident cars. by the number of of notifications sitting <laughs> on top of your. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's over there, thank God. But um, this this was his vacation from the week. He he got away from his phone. Yeah, my morning is funny. My wife's like, "You really don't want to be on your phone today. You left it at the house when you went dirt biking." I'm like, "Yeah." I was... <laughs> he didn't answer my text when I asked to confirm. So just he he yeah. truly got away from it. I did. I I was on. So I'm here the rest of the weekend. I got my one ride in, and I am going to go to Rampage on Friday to see my buddies compete. And uh, that is a spectacular venue to go there. But uh, yeah, I think I think what we've done. We'll see how the next 12 months go of customer meeting and, ex- meeting and exceeding customer expectation, how well we have support post-acquisition. Sorry for that. We've been talking a long time. Yeah. Um, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap it yeah. up here. But. And just to make sure we continue to be approachable and understand that we're still driving mechanical cars and they're fast and people make mistakes and trying to make sure <clears throat> we uh, educate people as well as we can on safety and building building you know an awareness into what our car can do because you can drive it to the to the campfire like everybody else's but damn when you get on it it's it's a whole nother world and and i think it's important to highlight and i've done this on the last few episodes that i've talked with performance people is that we're at a point now where safety is no longer like assumed like like we used to be in these days where we were at 80 horsepower or whatever and 23 the, on the Rhino and the ROPS on the ca- on the car and the the seat belts that came with it were for the 99 percent of everybody perfectly fine. But now we're at a point where not only do we have high horsepower, but we have the cap- suspension capability to go places at speeds that are truly dangerous. Watch the jump competition this weekend. Well, and that in, in, in what people are doing in the desert and on the rocks and stuff is is. It, that pales to some of the stuff that people are doing in these high horsepower, yeah. high suspension cars. And what people don't realize is that you can get in a car and be completely blindsided by the capability and feel like you can do anything. But you have to think about safety. And a lot of these cars that we're getting now, they they may have improved cages. They may have improved rigidity or whatever. But there's still a plastic. There's still a gap in the window. There's still opportunity yeah. for a big danger and so i know that there's been a lot of investment on the the chassis and the cage and and the a pillar b pillar setups and 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 the geometry that goes into that brought over from racing where safety is paramount and i think it's important to always remember the safety part of this and and talking back to what you were saying about building the car right from the first get-go 
you know, that's really been kind of the approach is bringing that racing safety into a production car. Yeah, you know, our car, you can put an aluminum roof on, put an aluminum firewall and a fuel cell on, <clears throat> excuse me, and some window nuts, and it's legal in every series. You got to weld it, you got to weld the bungs, but there's no other manufacturer who's done that. Yeah. I mean, that's spectacular. The fact that we took the time to make sure we would pass FIA score and best of desert rules with our car as long as you put an aluminum roof on, welded the bungs, and put a firewall in. And that's what we want to do. And, and, and unfortunately, people are going to get hurt in the cars. It happens. I mean, uh, in any car. In any car. It, I mean, and with the amount of cars out there today, it's 300 plus thousand UTVs or almost 400,000 UTVs sold a year, right? There's a lot more guys out here. I, you know, we talk about this. I live in the mountains where some mountain bike trails are directional, right? Um, bobsled up here. What is this one called on the fence? Yeah, yeah. Bobsled where Bob, S is around. Should be directional. I mean, I was talking to a guy yesterday who was coming down it at Mach 1 like we do, and a family was of three cars were just cruising up it. Right. All right. So go to Glamis. And God, there's so many new people out there. I mean, I, I cut my teeth riding dirt bikes and quads out there, right? <laughs> and we used to, you know, be really we didn't have to have flags and have anything go out there and there was crowded weekends but the speeds weren't there there was a and the weight and the weight you know there was a lot of big sand cars that were driven slow there's very few people who know how to drive a sand car out there fast there was a lot of us on bikes and quads and yeah there was guys who had bike to cut bike collisions it happened i mean i had one that's like a, all thumbs reattached and everything um but now there's a lot of high sport high horsepower utvs out there running those bowls and they didn't, people didn't grow up riding them. They don't know how to read them. They don't, and they just like, yeah, and add alcohol to that mix. And it's, right. it's a bad day. And, and the accessibility of UTVs, which is really what spurred a lot of the growth, right? And, and but it, it's super important just to remind ourselves, the experienced guys, but also to help educate all the new people yep. and, and to not approach it out of like, you know, yelling at them, but approach it from before you even go out. Just, hey, this is your first time on the dunes. This is what to expect. This is how to handle the situation and, and be a community of, of Advoc influential advocates yep. uh, for a safe, fun, adventure-filled weekend or whatever the case is. Um, and that goes straight to also like Moab and the issues they're facing with getting shut out of stuff. And it's like we as the community, I've, I say this over and over and over again on the podcast, like we have to be our own advocates and we have to protect what we have currently. Before we lose, I mean, we look at the uh, the friends of the Ocean the Anna, yeah. uh, Dunes and what the work they've had to go through to keep Pismo just to get it back, yep. and they only lost a little bit of it compared to what they could have lost. Um, great, and that, great kite surfing spot, <laughs> but I mean, just the sheer amount of time that had to go into that, let alone the money that was mm -hmm. raised to support that. Well, think how many times they tries they've they've closed sections of Glamis for the milkweed, right? Right. Those are just peep. Those are lobbyists leveraging. Something that has no, I could be totally wrong with saving a weed. I don't understand the value of that, but like they're just trying to close down the recreation. Like right. they, someone doesn't like the UTVs out there because for whatever reason, or they like the dirt bikes or the quads and they find something they can lobby on and they get it shut down. So we've got to well, be smart. There's people that make a career out of shutting things down, Yeah. you know, and so we just have to be advocates and we have to put the proof in our actions, you know, do as we say, not as we, you know, do as we need to do, not right. as we say to do. So um, trail cleanups, noise ordinances, turning your lights off on the road, uh, you know, the stereo systems, not doing donuts at midnight, like all those things. I know. Go come. I mean, I'm the I'm the last person to say I don't like doing donuts at midnight, but but there's a place for it and a time in in to will do you, it where it's appropriate. Pin, send me the pin drop on that. <laughs> right here, right in front of uh, the campfire. Well, hey, um, speaking of that, I probably should go get something to eat at by that campfire. Yeah, I'm starving. No, we definitely need to wrap this up. Um, First of all, thank you for your time. Oh, awesome. I mean, thank you for the invitation. This yeah. is a great, I told you earlier, there's not a lot of great conversations. A lot of them are redundant for me. Yeah. So thank you. This was really good. And it was, it was more off topic, but industry, yeah. uh, which I really enjoyed. So thank no, you. No, and I, and I fully plan on doing more and I, and I've been putting off, you know, trying to get Robbie on the show up until we can get this launched. So it's not about when's it coming out. It's yeah. more about what did we learn? Where are we going? How do we feel about this? That's where we want to take that conversation. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure you're living under a rock if you don't know where speed to follow speed at or where to leave a comment. But <laughs> Speedutv.com. <laughs> that, that was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you guys, there's there's definitely still time. You can still order another car, even though yeah. there's a long queue of, of people waiting. But. Unfortunately, I think uh, if you bought a new car today and you didn't go through one of our dealerships, you just ordered it online from us. I, I bet you wouldn't even see it till the summer. Yeah. Yeah. But but the good news yeah. is that cars are arriving next month. Yep. 
And, and cars are here, and it's been great. I, I personally have one myself, and I've been loving it. I'm breaking all the rules, which you're not supposed to do, but in Park City, they're legal, so I drive it to the restaurants. And <laughs> went mountain biking with it, and uh, and uh, went up in the mountains. I shot that drone footage that I think a lot of people really dug the other day, and they're just fun. I, I will be honest with you. Uh, I, I need to get back in and start enjoying uh, driving. I have found such a, a passion in, uh, in non-motorized sports lately. Yeah. That, um, well, you've been consumed by it. Yeah. So you know. I've, I've been riding my bicycles. and I actually ride my dirt bikes, but kiting and, uh, and skiing has been such a, a, a... I think the cool thing about those sports is the phone doesn't ring. Yeah, you know, and uh, or you can't answer it. So it's those uh, that hour and a half, two hours a day. So to go out in the car the other day, the thing that really bummed me out the most on it is when we go down and go racing or we go pre-running, you feel very comfortable that no one's coming the other way, right? Oh yeah, I never thought about because that. Because when you're pre-running, we're all going the same direction, and, and unless they're in a silver SUV that gets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, when I run out that trail the other day, I'm like, God, I would love to open this car up, but it's just not safe. It ain't right. And there's a lot of blind corners We're up on the mountains in the middle of nowhere. Like this could be families out here. Pup hunting. Now there's tours. Like even here, I watched like 10 Polaris Razors come out yep. of the camp the other day yep. on the golf course. I'm like, okay. So if you, st if you really want to enjoy the cars at the level I love driving from all the years of being behind the wheel, it's like, you have to go racing. Right. To, so for me to go out and, and my employees are with me, Connor, he's a great guy. He was thrilled to death. And I was like, I think we got to go to lunch. I'm like, I, I was getting a little worn out. Like, we had done like 70 miles and I was like, I'm, I'm over it. Let's go to lunch and we'll come back out a little later. But just because you couldn't push. And I, I think maybe there's 10% of us who want to push. And then we need to make sure, like we said, that you find places to do it safely. Because where I was, you can't push. There's too much, too much traffic. Especially at, during event season and, and stuff yeah. like that. So. But thank you. But no, thanks for coming on. I appreciate awesome your time. time. Yeah. Uh, you have a lot of people to go talk to at the trailer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can follow them. You can follow Todd. You have a, a, a great Instagram account. You do a lot of posting there, too. And um, uh, as much as your wife probably doesn't want people following your Instagram. But um, the uh, they're approachable. You can email them. You can talk to them uh, at all the shows. Um, and uh, like we said, the days are coming where these cars are going to be out on the road. Can't and, wait. And we're going to be able to see them proven out on the dirt and on the pavement and, and seeing what they can truly do, right? And I know you guys will be racing here qu quite quickly uh, at some of the upcoming races, right? Yeah, so we have a, we'll have a, definitely for 2022, um, we worked with Best of Desert on those rules and the homologation of cars, but we plan on a full score, full Best of the Desert series in 20, sorry, in 2023. Um, we are getting, I think, three cars prepared for the Baja 1000 and uh, still have, it's coming up close, but still have a lot of testing to do to make sure that right. when you build race cars, you, they're, it's a different it's level. It's a different level. <laughs> and, and I told Rob, I go, we're going, to, we're only going to Baja if we're 100% ready. We're not 11th hour to down there. I go, we have nothing to gain if uh, by going, we only have to lose. So let's make sure we're 100% prepared. So right. uh, we'll work, our guys work day and night, but I, I'm, I want to make sure. I'm, I mean, I've got to, it's only going to add one more wheel I got to get behind because I already am behind two trucks. So. Uh, and uh, and shout out to like Daniel and his crew oh. of engineers and guys that have been putting their entire youthful lives into this project. I yeah. know I, I fully understand their commitment to this and what they're sacrificing. So I don't know if you do, and I'm going to pay <laughs> them a bigger compliment. I don't understand the life our engineers have chosen, and I want to thank them <laughs> entirely because they don't have a home. Like we have two homes uh, in in Charlotte, uh, right on the water. They're side by side, and the engineers live in them. Live in one of them. We live in the other. Robbie lives in the other. Um, but they live at the shop. And when they don't live at the shop, they live at Havasu. When they don't live in Havasu, they live in Anaheim. When they're not living in Anaheim, they're overseas. I, I, I don't get it. Like, I can't work like that. <laughs> I, I, I love those guys. And, they, and I try to set an example. I only ask people to do what I would do. Thank God they work for Robbie. They're, like, I have my teams and he has his because they, what they do and what they continue to do amazes me. And that's why this car is where it is today and why people will be excited about it because um, – they just, none of those guys take breaks. They don't, I mean, a vacation was COVID. They got sick. Yeah. Uh, Daniel got COVID and he couldn't work for 10 days. Yeah. That was his vacation. So if you see these guys, don't pat us on the back. Uh, we're the visionaries, but they're the, they, they really are the workers. And it's pretty spectacular, the people we have. For sure. Yeah. So speedutv.com, uh, speedutv on social. Yep. Uh, you even have YouTube with all sorts. You guys did a 24-hour live stream thingy. What yeah. was that all about? That... Oh, I don't even know about that. There one. was a there was a live stream loop of a video. It was it said twenty four hour live stream test. Oh, oh, I think because we're looping that that blue car shot the drone footage on. I think they're gonna run that in a loop.
So I think they were just testing the loop. I think that's what Rob Harris was doing. Oh. I, I've been off the grid on these guys. I need to probably <laughs> tune back in. You never um, know what you're going to get at Speed U TV, so follow <laughs> no, them. No, you don't. And I think we just lost <laughs> video, so we'll wrap the episode <laughs> on that. Todd, thanks for joining me here uh, at the booth. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace. <laughs>